Our last act is a panel discussion. The moderator was the former director of NASA's Ames Research Center. He will introduce the panel. So please welcome to the Starmus Earth stage, Scott Hubbard. know that we are the last effort between you and your favorite beverage. So we will be focused and be clear and be quick. I have a tremendous panel to discuss the topic today. It's been a three astronaut day. You don't get those very often. So perhaps it's appropriate that we talk about humans to the moon and Mars. Let me first introduce scientist Patrick Michel, Director of Research for CNRS and an expert in asteroids. Next, Joel Parker from Southwest Research Institute studies the moon and comets, trans Neptunian objects. And finally, my old colleague once again here on stage, Garrett Reisman, ex astronaut, SpaceX advisor and a member of the faculty of the USC. So I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and make this now a four astronaut day. When I told my old colleagues at NASA that I was going to be here at Starmus, that we were going to be talking about exploring the universe, but also focusing on climate change, they said, oh, you must take this, and they sent me a clip from Victor Clover. Victor is going to fly on Artemis II at the end of next year, and they wanted NASA to give you a special greeting. So let's play that clip. Hello, I'm NASA astronaut Victor Glover. I had the privilege of spending 168 days in space and completed four spacewalks while living and working aboard the International Space Station. One of our favorite pastimes aboard the unique microgravity laboratory is looking back at our beautiful home planet 250 miles below us from the vantage of a seven-sided cupola window. Seeing Earth from space is life-changing. We see that thin line of our atmosphere that protects us from micrometeoroids in the vacuum of space. It reminds us how fragile our planet really is. And it's much more than a magnificent view. Much of our research aboard the space station focuses on learning more about our planet to understand how human actions affect Earth and how together we can better take care of it so that future generations can experience the beauty, wonder, and abundance of our amazing home planet. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, NASA. I still, I still have a few low friends in high places, as they say. Okay, uh, I'm going to once again introduce the topic of what NASA at least is doing to send humans back in the deep space to the moon and then on to Mars. So if we can bring up those charts, please, then I will very quickly give you an overview of what's happening. So NASA has formulated the Artemis program, and the very first question that they addressed is, why do we explore? And particularly, why do we explore with humans? And they've developed a three-leg stool. One is science, includes all the human research, biology, physics, and so forth. One is national posture, and that includes international collaborations to advance greater uh, greater objectives. And finally, inspiration. We've talked a great deal at this meeting about the inspirational nature of the sort of exploration that we do. Now, who will NASA partner with? At least 40 nations, if not more. This shows the kind of reach of what's called the Artemis Accords, which is a series of bilateral agreements to work together for the peaceful exploration of space. Now, what is the Artemis architecture? Those of you who were here earlier heard Charlie Duke describe this in greater detail, but in a very simple terms, Artemis I was an unmanned test of the launch vehicle and the Orion capsule around the moon, and it happened around September in 22. 
Artemis II, where Victor Glover will fly, is going to be the first crew test around the moon in late 2025. And Artemis III is going to be landing on the moon in 2026. How will we guide the science? I'm very delighted to say that NASA has agreed to task the National Academies to conduct a study to provide a science strategy for the human exploration of Mars, one of the three stool, three legs of that very important exploration stool. And finally, what about the entrepreneurs? You've heard a little about this. You may hear more. The human landing system has been selected to be provided by industry in the way described earlier uh, by Garrett Reisman, SpaceX and Blue Origin both. So with that introduction, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to now spend a few minutes, describe your research, and also comment, if you can, on the overall goal of human exploration of the Moon and Mars. Let's begin with Patrick. Oh, yeah, so, okay. I thought you were going to... I caught him unawares. ...ask Please. me a question. Okay, so... I'm, um, so I'm an astrophysicist, a director of research in France at the Côte d'Azur Observatory in Nice. You're welcome to visit. And I'm uh, uh, working on asteroid science. As we have seen, asteroids, there are many reasons to study asteroids. Science, because they are the best tracers of the solar system history. There is also a reason that we call planetary defense, how to mitigate an impact on Earth and also linked to human exploration. They may be used as resources because they contain oxygen, hydrogen, and on the long term, we could use them as gas stations in order to refuel and go further in the solar system. So currently, because we have to save time, I'm gonna tell you about a mission for which I serve as a principal investigator called the HERA mission. It is linked to another mission you certainly heard about, which is called the DART mission by NASA. So DART was the first mission that deflected an object from its initial trajectory. And it's also probably the first mission where we shoot a spacecraft and it crashes and we call it a success. And in fact, from this impact, we don't really know what is the outcome, in which state is the asteroid that we deflected. And this is where the HERA mission from the European Space Agency will launch with the Falcon 9 from SpaceX on the 7th of October this year to go back to the crime scene and to understand what happened, to check the final result of this impact so that we can validate the numerical impact models that we can extra extrapolate to other scenarios. So now, this is linked to actually saving Earth because it's linked to protecting the planet from, Earth in, from a, an asteroid impact. Of course, it's a very low probability risk. The very small objects we don't care about because they make just very local uh, damages. We start to care for objects larger than 100 meters in size. And the real advantage of this risk is that it is possible to predict and prevent it with reasonable and feasible means. And this is why we do that. How is it linked to human exploration? Two reasons. First is astronauts know even better than Earth that Earth is an environment where it receives a lot of things. And it's actually the reason why it is Rusty Reichardt, the astronaut of Apollo 9, that was the first to really go to the UN and to ask for an international response to this problem. So astronauts were really helped to raise the awareness of this risk, which of course we don't have to panic about. Climate change is heavy, uh, of course more urgent, but still, as I said, since we can do something about it, it's important. The other reason I will finish there is inspiration because strangely, students love this subject. I have more requests to work with me on planetary defense than on asteroid science. Maybe because they saw the movie, they want to be the next, I mean, not Bruce Willis, because he ended Bruce badly Willis. in the movie. But, uh, but the, yeah, effectively, because there is a challenge there, there is also uh, a link to the protection of the planet, and human exploration is also an amazing source of inspiration. So this is a, the link we do, because of course, there is nothing that is better than, you know, 
knowing that the human is in space, landing somewhere else. I mean, this, how can we not be inspired by that, by that? Thank you very much, Patrick. Joel, your thoughts. Well, I've, I feel a little bit of an odd man out. I'm not a Mars or Moon expert, and I'm no experience in space, but I'd put in an application. Um, but my experience is that uh, I've studied massive stars, stars 100 times the size of our sun, um, as an observational astronomer. And then I started observing objects in the solar system, comets, moons, asteroids, and uh, had the chance, I was very lucky, to be on three once-in-a-lifetime missions. I was involved with Rosetta, which you saw earlier, which was the first mission to land on a comet, New Horizons, which was the first mission to fly by Pluto, and now Lucy, which is the first mission to visit the Trojan asteroids. But at heart, I'm an observational astronomer, and so I come to this question from that perspective. You know, what science can be enabled by going to the moon, going to Mars? And one of the things I love about being an observational astronomer is you get to go to remote mountains, high on a mountain top, away from everything, and your job is to look at the sky, which is a pretty good job. So the moon, one of the things that makes the moon very difficult to live actually makes it a very good place to do observational astronomy. On the Earth, you have this atmosphere, which is good for us, but it makes the light from stars fuzzy. And it also absorbs some light, like ultraviolet and infrared. And that's why we go to the high mountaintops, to get over as much of that as we as we possibly can. And that's also why we go to space, to get above the atmosphere. Well, the moon is kind of like being out in space with no atmosphere. So we could build telescopes on the moon that are like space telescopes. They would be able to see ultraviolet and infrared all across the spectrum. They wouldn't have an atmosphere to distort the images. And another plus is they're local. We can build very big telescopes on the ground, and we can service them more easily than telescopes in space. So there's a lot of good advantages to put telescopes for observing on the moon. Uh, your observing night might be two weeks on many parts of the moon, but if you go into what are called permanently shadowed craters, those have nighttime all the time. And so you could do some really great astronomy with telescopes on the moon, including in the radio, because if you're on the far side of the moon, you're away from the interference of radio interference that we get here on Earth. So going there could enable some very significant science in astronomy and understanding the universe from the other side of the moon. Thank you, Joel. Well stated. <laughs> Garrett, you've been in space. Uh, you've got a lot of experience with the entrepreneurs now in SpaceX. Uh, give us some of your thoughts about the challenges and benefits of human exploration. Well, I highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> well, um, you know, it, it's such a wonderful time right now for to be working in human spaceflight. I was inspired by the Apollo missions to the moon, but I was too young to really experience it firsthand. It was all via watching videos. And then we entered this period when I came to NASA where our ambitions were a bit lower. And I remember going as a brand new astronaut to visit the NASA administrator, who was Dan Golden at the time. And he pulled us uh, up close in his office and he says, I have a secret I want to share with you, but you can't tell anybody. 
someday I hope we go to Mars. <laughs> but don't say it out loud because Congress won't, will be very angry with us that uh, we're being foolhardy with their money. We can't even talk about it in public. So shh, it's a secret. We've come a long way. And now NASA is talking very openly and very excitedly about the moon to Mars uh, paradigm and the Artemis uh, program. <clears throat> and, and that's a wonderful thing. And I'm most excited about Mars because the possibility exists on Mars that you have enough in situ resources that you could make a sustainable uh, colony someday on, on Mars. Now, there are two schools of thought. Uh, we could just, we might soon have the capability to just go. And my former boss uh, would like to pursue that approach and just go. But there's some major challenges and unknowns and risks that we really don't have good answers to right now. And I would categorize them in two, in two areas. The, the, the first is we don't know what human, what human bodies uh, look like or, or what the effect on, on human bodies of partial gravity. So we have tons of data on the human physiology in 1G. You're all data points, congratulations. We have billions of data points. We have hundreds of data points on what the human physiology, how it reacts to microgravity but we have n virtually nothing in between. There are 12 men that spent a couple days in partial gravity, and we don't have nearly enough information to draw any conclusions from that. So we don't know if this is linear from zero to one. We have nothing in between, no data in between zero and one. So we're just guessing about a lot of the things that happen to our body. Will a little bit of gravity, a third approximately of the Earth's gravity on Mars be enough? Will a sixth of Earth's gravity on the moon be enough? We, we don't know. We have no clue. Uh, the other thing we don't know is how does the human organism survive or, or respond to the radiation environment? And this is the most serious hazard to human health when we look at going beyond low Earth orbit again. So that we know exactly what kind of radiation is out there. We've sent probes and we have instruments on there. We know exactly the, the flux, the density of the galactic cosmic radiation. We know every once in a while we get a solar uh, proton event, we get coronal mass ejections, and we know pretty well how to characterize those and the probability of their occurrence. But we don't know what that stuff does to the human body. No humans have really been exposed to that type of radiation for any significant amount of time. 24 men, one of whom has been with us this week at Starmus, I might add, uh, have gone out beyond the protection of the Earth's magnetic field and have been exposed to galactic cosmic radiation. But the longest duration was a little bit over 12 days. So we really still are clueless as to how the human body responds. If you go to Mars, you can't just go and come right back. It's going to be about uh, two and a half years uh, round trip uh, on the low end. And if you're exposed to that radiation for that period of time, we, ex we think you'll take about a sievert of radiation. That currently exceeds NASA's limits for your career as an astronaut. So we have some major questions. We can answer these questions in an incremental approach by going back to the moon. And seeing what happens if you spend a month there, if you spend six months there, if you spend a year there. Mm -hmm. And if we're patient, and again, my former boss is not a patient man, and, and that's, he's not going to be happy. Elon Musk, he means. <laughs> but if you're patient, uh, then we could do this in a safe manner, and I think that's the, the best reason to go back to the moon. Thanks a lot, Garrett. Really appreciate the insight. So we've got uh, maybe 10 minutes left, and what I want to do now is pose a few questions to the panel questions that I collected during this last week. And the first one comes from a student at the Comenius University. I had the great opportunity to, to give a talk about exploring Mars there. And afterwards, several students came up, and this one student said, we know that climate change is an existential crisis. How can we continue to advocate for or support these exploration ventures when we've got climate change to worry about. So I would like each of you to address this, starting with Patrick. Okay, so I would probably say two things to be short. I know some answers. So one is that the human that go in space, if we talk about human explorations, are the best witness of how fragile is the Earth. 
And I think we, we need to see it with our eyes to really understand that. And I remember Jean-Francois Clairvoy, an astronaut, was telling me what you said in your talk, which is the realization of the, how thin is the atmosphere. This little skin is really what makes life possible. And by, by seeing it from space made him realize that, wow, we are very fragile, so we have to be careful. And, and I see that in uh, some conferences, when I do conferences with astronauts, and they tell the story, which is lived by themselves, experienced by themselves, and we know that they are courageous, they take risks, because it's incredibly risky, despite the success, to go to space. So when they say we have to be careful, that really means something. So I think human exploration serves its purpose to tell us how it is to be out there and how it feels to see the Earth from space. And we need this. The second is that human exploration now really relies on international cooperation. And of course, to solve climate change, we need international cooperation. And I know that for the ISS, for instance, because it was an international behavior, we had to find new ways to collaborate with each other because there were some technology transfers, etc. And all these ways can be then used to make this international cooperation more efficient, even to solve the climate problem. And the final thing I would say, but that's my personal thing, is that what I could see, because I, I, I was involved in many space missions, including Osiris Rex, Hayabusa 2 in Japan, etc., is that what we show in space with all this success is that we can tackle incredible challenges. And the reason why we can do that is because we, are, we have patience, we are perseverant, we are ready to make all efforts, we will accept the failures, we work in a team spirit. And using this, we can show that we can tackle incredible challenges in space. And I think that it's a great example that we can you know, use on Earth to solve the same problems. And so we give demonstration when we send a human and we succeed to land it on the moon. I mean, this is a clear demonstration that you can tackle incredible challenges, and that gives hope to tackle the same on Earth and solve the climate problem. So that's my Well said. Thank you. Joel, what do you think? How, what would be an answer? Well, I, I don't see it as a this or that, that right. it's climate change or exploration. It's not this or that. I think it's a this and that. It's all a matter of what we want to put our resources toward. And I would say, you know, right now we have all these issues with climate change and crises going on on Earth, and yet we still find value in supporting the arts, supporting music, supporting museums. Why do we put money towards those in such hard times? And I think the answer is the same reason we want to explore the universe is we feel that there's something important about that. That in our hearts, there's something about being human that's important to have art, to have music, and to explore. And I think it's important to stay human while we solve our problems. So I think we need both. <laughs> Great. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thank you. I think, I think we're, we're convinced. <laughs> <laughs> but are you? <laughs> yeah. And I th I'm pretty sure this audience is too. But I just want to add a little bit of perspective. And, and I think there's a misperception out there as far as how much we are spending on space. Right. And in the United States, anyway, the NASA's entire budget amounts to less than one half of 1% of the, federal, the total federal budget. So that means of every tax dollar we collect from our citizens, we spend less than one half of one penny on NASA. And that's just not just human exploration of space, and Artemis is also the James Webb Space Telescope, it's curiosity, it's spirit, it's opportunity, it's all our missions, uh, it's OSIRIS-REx, it's everything that we do. And if you took that one half of one penny and spent it on climate change, I would like, I would love to tell you that that would solve the problem. <laughs> yeah. 
But sadly, it's going to take a lot more than that. And it's going to take a lot more than just the United States. This is going to have to be an international effort of unprecedented scale to solve the problem that we've created for ourselves. But we must do it. Excellent. Excellent thought. <laughs> So since this is Starmus, stars and music, I didn't want to let this opportunity go by without telling you that I've been talking to some of my colleagues on the music side uh, of this event to see if they have questions. So Ron Bumblefoot, Th Bumblefoot Thal says, has there been any progress in a new launch technology to reduce the travel time to the moon and Mars or elsewhere. Maybe you could just tease us a little bit about the Starship here. Uh, Starship uses traditional chemical propulsion. So it's a, a, a methyl ox. It's methane, liquid methane, and liquid oxygen. And the reason that those propellants were chosen was that you can actually make methane and liquid oxygen on Mars. So by uh, the Sabatier process, you could combine the, the CO2 in the Martian atmosphere with the with the uh, oxygen that you take from the, the ice that's available, the water ice, and create that fuel. So unfortunately, Starship is not going to speed up necessarily, although with, if we have sufficient delta V, we can go a little bit faster. But it's not going to be a breakthrough as far as it's, we're not going to go at warp speed uh, in Starship to Mars. I wish we could. But there are technologies that are out there. Maybe you guys want to talk a little bit about nuclear thermal and about plasma and, and some of the other possibilities uh, that could. Uh, take us at much higher velocities. So there is a, an agreement that was just signed uh, between NASA and in the U.S. something called DARPA, which is an advanced projects agency for a new project called DRACO. And DRACO is going to be a demonstration of nuclear thermal propulsion. So if something has the potential to be able to, uh, to help uh, Bumblefoot's question here. I think that's at least one of them. Um, I think I, we ought to close out here by giving each of us a chance to summarize in a minute or so thoughts about the big question of human exploration and anything else you'd like to add. Let's start again with you, Garrett, and work this way. Well, uh, you know, I showed the picture before, and you can see it a little bit on the screen behind us about, and Victor Glover talked about it too, we meant, and you mentioned it, that the, the, the thin blue line of the atmosphere being so incredibly fragile. But there's another thing about that picture. When you look at the Earth from space, it's, that image is the antithesis of tribalism. And we live in a world of ever increasing division in our society amongst nations and internal to nations. And when you go to space, you see the folly in all that. It's ridiculous. We are in this together. We need to solve our problems together, and we need to get along together. Excellent. Joel. All right. I, I feel pressure to try, try to wrap up a week of Starmus here. <laughs> um, I, th I think what I would say is uh, if we go to the moon, go back to Mars, just other exploring like that. So we, we have the, the scientists who can tell us the, the what and the where. What are the science questions we want to ask? Where can we go uh, to answer those questions? We have the engineers who can tell us the how. They can tell us how to get there, how to build habitation to live on these other places, how to avoid collisions. So we have the Scientists and engineers telling us the, the what, the how, and the where. But it's the artists that tell us the why. It's the musicians and the writers and the visual artists who can take these experiences and translate them into so many different ways across barriers of language of what those experiences are. And, and it reminds me of a scene from the movie Contact, where the main character, Ellie Arroway, who is a character based on Jill Tarter from right. Starmus, and she is struck by such 
profound experience in what she sees that she doesn't have words for it. And all she can say is, they should have sent a poet. <laughs> and I think that feels like an essence of Starmus, the science and the technology and the art. And I think all I could say is, when we go back to the moon and if we go to Mars, we can't forget to send a poet. Well said. Patrick? Yeah. So it's actually a message to the young generation. First of all, I must say that although we have big problems to solve on Earth, we live an extraordinary epoch in terms of exploration when we see all the uh, projects uh, that are going on in space. And we saw the European Space Agency this afternoon, the amazing number of projects and fantastic discovery we're going to do. So this is really exciting because this is something we couldn't do a century before. And, th and that's really great. The other thing is, I always think that, you know, coming back to human exploration, and, or a sailing boat that goes in the middle of the ocean, the first thing you do, you, you build a team which you know will agree with each other, will be, co there will be cohesion, because if something happens on the boat mm -hmm. and you are faced with many dangers and they kill each other, that doesn't help. And actually the Earth is like a sailing boat in the middle of an ocean, and we should work all together to solve our problems. So now, what I really think is, and that's for the young generation, I see students, and they often think, I will not be able to succeed. We won't solve the climate problem, etc. I'm not able to have an immediate success. No, nothing is immediate. It's not a like on Instagram that makes you successful. What the space missions show, and we heard that many times, it took 20 years, 20 years of effort, the concept of long-term efforts. That's fine. It's never instantaneous. It's always a lot of efforts to be done, not, f not s being scared by failure. It's normal. We don't have a, a linear way towards success. You must have failures. You learn from them, and then you be become better. Working in a team, accepting the diversity, you need different expertise. It's absolutely amazing to work with different cultures, very enriching because we have different ways of working, different ways of speaking. And when we are able to enjoy that and to not fear the risks to fail, we can do incredible things. And as I said, we demonstrated that in space, and I want the young generation to find their passion and if they find their passion and they work that way, they will have fun in their life, and I'm hopeful we'll solve the problem of the climate change. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> I, would like to, I would like to conclude this panel with uh, my own thoughts about Starmus and this week and uh, other related things. When I was nine years old, I really wanted to know, was there life anywhere else in the universe? I had read science, I'd read science fiction, and I was absolutely focused on trying to find out the answer to that really fundamental question that faces uh, humanity for thousands of years. And I was uh, fortunate year 30, uh, 40 years later <laughs> to be able to found NASA's Astrobiology Institute and, and achieve part of that dream. But along the way, when I was about 13 or 14, I learned to play the guitar. And then I went to undergraduate school in physics and astronomy at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. And I ended up staying there for several years past my graduation to see rocket science, music. Rocket science, music. I ended up choosing rocket science. And I'm very grateful that I did. But on the other hand, I'm also grateful to Brian May and Garrick Israelian for inviting me and this panel to be here and be part of Starmus. So please enjoy the rest of your evening, and thanks very much. And thank you, Starmus. <laughs>